everybody knows by this time, I think maybe on the Zoom where the chat is at the bottom of your screen. If at any time um, tonight you should have a question, we're going to ask you to type it into the chat. Um, even though the question may be something that gets answered later on in presentation, we'll have those questions that Ori will open up the chat and go through all of those questions that he didn't didn't answer. Um, and we'll also open it up for questions that if you're one of those that don't want to type in chat, you'll get your chance to ask the questions. But please use the chat as the presentation is on. I'm, I'm honored as well as excited about our presenter tonight, Ori Eckes. He's employed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at the Genoa National Fish Hatchery in Genoa, Wisconsin, where he's the lead fish biologist. Uh, the Genoa National Fish Hatchery uh, has played a major role in the conservation of aquatic species since its founding in 1932. And, but over the years, its mission of the hatchery has changed from providing sport fish for area waters to conservation hatchery concerned with recovery of endangered uh, species. The station rears more than 26 aquatic species varying life stages, equating to more than 40 million fish, eggs, mussels to support the management, restoration, research objectives all across the country. Uh, tonight, we're gonna to learn more about this great place as well as their important projects working with endangered species. So Ori, we greatly appreciate you sharing your knowledge and your experience and time with us tonight. Thank you. Okay, can you guys see my screen okay? All good. All good, perfect. Well, uh, well guys, uh, thanks for inviting me to this presentation. Uh, really look forward to talking to you guys as a group here. I wanted to give you a little bit of information uh, about myself. Uh, I'm from uh, Marshfield, Wisconsin, so central Wisconsin. I moved to La Crosse about 10 years ago uh, to study biology, and I went to the University of Wisconsin-La Crosse. From there, I uh, actually got my master's in aquatic sciences, and my passion's been uh, studying lake sturgeon, although we do uh, rear uh, more species than that, uh, freshwater mussels, dragonflies, and we'll talk about that as we go. Uh, just to picture my family here, myself and my wife, uh, we actually have three, three little kids, and when I'm not uh, out on the river or on the hatchery, you know, hunting and fishing is kind of what we do. Um, just a picture of myself and uh, my oldest son, uh, Easton, who's seven, have a shed hunting dog, spend a little bit of time in the tree stands. And like I said, uh, fishing too. Uh, the photo on the left here is actually a picture at the fish hatchery. We have a rainbow trout pond uh, that is access to anybody to feed the fish. And this is my son out at the river catching fish and my youngest daughter basically with her head in the live well. So as, uh, as Don said, the uh, mission of the Fish and Wildlife Service is working with others to conserve, protect, and enhance uh, fish, wildlife, and plants and their habitats for the continuing benefit of the American people. And tonight I'm going to focus on lake sturgeon, freshwater mussels, and uh, we'll briefly talk about dragonflies. And I think in between those three sessions, I'll pause for questions, uh, probably 15 minutes uh, apiece. However, I did want to show you our, our website. If you go on to, uh, if you just Google Genoa National Fish Hatchery, you can actually get a link to our virtual tour of the hatchery. So you can see where we're located within the United States here. So we're in Southwest Wisconsin, just south of La Crosse. And here's an overview of our hatchery. So. We have 21 different ponds. So everything you can see here in yellow is property owned by the hatchery, including some uh, refuge lands. Um, we have three buildings that are basically cold water buildings. So we raise, I'm only gonna talk about the lake sturgeon mainly for fish, but we do raise uh, brook trout, rainbow trout, lake trout, lake herring. In our ponds, we raise walleyes, bluegills, crappies, perch, 
catfish, uh, you name it, we, we pretty much uh, raise it. And uh, mainly some of these sport fish that we're raising are for our freshwater mussel program, which I'll get into a little bit later on why we have so many different species. So that's a good link if you want to check that out. And then also on Facebook. We have the uh, Genoa National Fish Hatchery and Great River Road. Here's, here goes to the actual uh, the video and everything that you can watch. But we do have a Facebook site as well that's full of uh, pictures and images that you can see. And we recently opened a visitor center a couple of years ago, but due to uh, COVID, it's not open right now, but uh, we look forward to having that open again as well. So with that being said, I'm gonna uh, turn back to uh, uh, my primary research in graduate school and what my passion is at work right now. It's, it's a pretty rare sight for me to be in the office. As you can see behind me, I'm in the office, but usually I'm right here in uh, Genoa, Wisconsin and working outside with the many different fish that we raise. So the hatchery has basically been in operation for 89 years. Uh, between on average about 13 species of fish we're raising and 19 species of freshwater mussels. So these are just a few images of, of a few of those. And before I talk about lake sturgeon, I just want to mention uh, walleyes because I get pretty excited about that too. Uh, this time of the year, basically first week of April, we'll be out on the Mississippi River. So just south of Janella, we'll be setting, as you can see in this middle picture here, uh, what we call hoop nets. We set 50 of those every day and we leave them overnight. And then we collect the fish in those every morning and we're targeting walleyes. So you can see on the bottom right here, uh, this picture of me spawning a walleye. Uh, once those uh, fish are spawned and fertilized, the eggs are fertilized, bring them back to the hatchery where we incubate them in jars like this called McDonald jars. And currently this year, we have about 15 million requests for eggs. And we'll also keep some of those for ourselves to rear in our ponds to support uh, freshwater mussel conservation as well. And here, beautiful picture on the river. Uh, this is what I get to see for about a month straight on the Mississippi River. Uh, sometimes there's bycatch in the nets. Uh, here you can see a freshwater drum and eagle coming by and picking it up. And we get some pretty close shots. It's pretty, pretty neat to see. So I thought I'd share that with you guys. And we do come across the lake sturgeon on the Mississippi River as well. Now for our, our lake sturgeon program, we actually raise uh, five different strains of lake sturgeon. So as you can see here on the map, there's 27 species of sturgeon. Uh, the freshwater species are pallids, shovel nose, and lake sturgeon. And the ones we're raising here are lake sturgeon. And I'll focus mainly on uh, in Wisconsin on the Wolf River system because that's one of the most studied populations and that I'm most familiar with. But we actually I uh, do raise fish for the state of Tennessee, Missouri. Uh, we have partners out in New York as well on the St. Lawrence River. So we actually go out to New York on the St. Lawrence River and collect eggs, bring them back to our hatchery. And then we will actually raise them up and then drive back and stock them back into tributaries of the St. Lawrence River. So we go actually quite a ways. And the reason we're raising these fish is because they're endangered, threatened, or of special concern. So some of our lake sturgeon restoration goals, basically to manage and enhance wild populations of lake sturgeon on federal, state, and tribal uh, lands, water bodies. And this is an older graph that uh, basically goes back from 2000 to 2011. Uh, in 2011, we're stocking 50,000 fingerlings, basically eight inch fish. Uh, in the last few years, we've been up in the, upward of 80,000 fingerlings that we're stocking to support various programs. So some of the reasons for their decline, this uh, top right picture is actually a picture of a dam located in Shawano, Wisconsin, which is one of the uh, main collection places on the Wolf River that we actually go and collect uh, uh, lake sturgeon eggs. Uh, some of the reasons for their decline, poaching, uh, dam construction. Historically, these fish on this river system would swim upstream to spawn. Uh, with the construction of the dam here, they're not able to get up to 
uh, Casino Falls where they used to, and then also habitat loss. Now, unlike many other fish, lake sturgeon have a really unique life cycle. So they, they're very long lived. Uh, males can live 55 to 70 years, females 80 to 150 years. They do not spawn every year. So every other or every three to five years. And the one really key note here is these fish have to survive a long time in the wild before they can actually reach sexual maturity. So you're looking at males uh, having to live 12 to 15 years before they can reproduce and females uh, 20 to 25 years. Now, when these fish uh, do spawn, they, uh, they spawn in a rocky substrate. The top picture here is a picture of lake sturgeon eggs basically in the rocks. Uh, they spawn, and they lay their eggs in uh, really flowing water. So they have this adhesive layer that allows them basically to stick to the rocks so they don't get blown downstream. Uh, incubation temperatures in the river is really important for survival of the eggs. And uh, once they uh, lay the eggs and they're fertilized, the parents uh, go back to the main body of water. So there's very little parental care for these fish. And in the wild, basically your mortality rate is 99%. So survival in the wild is very limited for this species uh, due to a lot of predatory fish eating the eggs and such. Now, when we see these fish at the dams, uh, they basically, they're coming up to the dam to spawn because they can't get any farther. And this is a, basically a picture of what we see. We'll see uh, four or five male lake sturgeon, uh, basically hover around one female lake sturgeon and she'll be laying eggs and the males will be fertilizing those eggs. And generally uh, by studying some of the offspring of these fish, we're seeing basically a contribution of five to seven female or males per female contribution. So that's what we aim for when we go out and collect. We actually fertilize uh, eggs uh, five to one. So one female will get fertilized by five different males just to kind of mimic the natural habitat. Now, like I said, this is a picture of the Wolf River. So you're in Wisconsin right here. Uh, they're a freshwater fish. They spawn between April and May. The uh, lake sturgeon that we get from out east in New York, those don't spawn until about um, the first week of June. So it's all dependent on uh, region of location. And these fish, they do have a, a homing response, kind of like some of your salmon or your trout where they can imprint on the natal river where they were born. And they tend to come back to those areas when they're adults to actually lay their eggs and reproduce. Uh, here's another close up picture of us at the Shawano Dam. So you can see the dam here. The sturgeon will come in here basically and just uh, pile up in massive numbers. And you'll basically see shark tails across the entire river length, river length for a week or two. And then they're basically just gone and they migrate back. So our role at the hatchery to restore these populations, we're actually going out to uh, known populations like the Wolf River and we're collecting eggs. So the picture on the left here is us collecting eggs from an adult female sturgeon. The picture on the right is uh, some of our partners with Wisconsin DNR. They're actually collecting the, uh, the fish with nets and bringing them up to the shore so we can uh, strip the eggs and the, the milt from the lake sturgeon. So another picture here on the top right, you can see a picture of a lake sturgeon being netted. On the top left, uh, those are the black eggs that are ready to be fertilized. And the bottom left here is a, a male sturgeon. Basically, we collect the uh, milt in a syringe until we get enough milt, five males to fertilize one female. Once those uh, adults, once we collect the gametes from those adults, the bottom right picture here, the, uh, the fish are weighed, they're measured, and they're released right back into the river, kind of like a little stream side uh, slip and slide for the sturgeon. They, basically, they go right back where they, where they were. So we're not removing all the eggs, just a portion of them for what we need for restoration purposes. Once we collect the eggs, uh, top left picture here, uh, we uh, iodine the eggs. And basically the, when we bring fish back on station, all the eggs that we bring back on station are, uh, are iodine to prevent any disease or uh, potential pathogen coming into the hatchery. 
on the far right picture, here's a picture of uh, your lake sturgeon eggs. This is all from one female, all fertilized and ready to be brought back to the hatchery. When we're at the riverbank, uh, once everything's fertilized, we put the eggs in styrofoam containers, fill them with fresh well water. So none of our water ever comes from the river. It's all fresh well water from the hatchery. Uh, <clears throat> the bags are then basically tied shut, uh, put into a box, and then we load those into the truck and we drive them back to the fish hatchery. Now, as I mentioned before, in the wild, those eggs are very adhesive. So they stick to substrates like rocks because of flowing current. And in the hatchery, that becomes an issue with us. Uh, we use bentonite clay or Fuller's earth, which you can see in the top left picture right here. We use a turkey feather. We basically stir the eggs in bentonite clay or Fuller's earth. And that just removes that sticky adhesive layer. Because when we bring them back to the hatchery, we put them into these jars, McDonald jars, where we flow water through them for about 10 days before they'll hatch. And if they stuck together, uh, we would have fungus problems and they probably wouldn't survive. But by de-adhesing those eggs, uh, it really helps us out. Bottom left picture here are newly hatched lake sturgeon fry. So they're really small, half inch, three quarters of an inch. There's probably about five to 10,000 fish just in this one tank alone. Now in the wild, uh, these guys are bottom feeding fish. So you can see their mouth right here of an adult lake sturgeon. And you can see their barbels up in front, kind of like a catfish. So they're swimming along the bottom. They can basically taste and feel their prey before they actually come and uh, consume it. And in the wild, they're feeding on, uh, when they're young, zooplankton, they switch kind of over the insect larvae, uh, bloodworms. Uh, they will eat snails, leeches, clams, crayfish, all their small fish. And there's even been evidence of uh, zebra mussels in their guts too, which can be very beneficial as you guys probably have heard of zebra mussels. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit when we discuss mussels. So in the hatchery, we raise our own brine shrimp. We order it from a company. Uh, we hatch brine shrimp. So that's basically their, their zooplankton source. And we do order blood worms. They come frozen to us. So we keep them on a pretty much natural diet. And once they get six to eight inches, we switch them over to frozen krill. And at that point, uh, they're about eight inches long and they're ready to be stocked back into the wild. So here you can see a picture on the left. This is just one of many tanks. Like I said, the, the, one of our best years is probably about 85,000 at this juvenile size at about six to eight inches long. So just a picture of those as they grow out. On the top right here, we have a, we, we recruit uh, many volunteers. We have friends groups at the hatchery, uh, friends of Pool 9, friends of the Upper Mississippi River that work with us to help tag these fish. So every one of these fish gets a tag. Uh, the middle picture here is actually a coated wire tagging machine and a little piece of metal is inserted into that fish and it's magnetic. So we tag the fish, scan it across the wand to make sure that the fish is tagged and then it goes back into the tank and it's ready to be stocked. Uh, so, so that helps us in the future when uh, we have biologists out in the wild basically collecting data on how these fish are surviving and how they're growing. So we can tell if it's a hatchery fish by scanning the fish. On the bottom right picture here is another type of tag. It's called a pit tag. It's a passive integrated transponder tag. It's basically like what you would put into a pet at home, dog or a cat. And this tag will actually give you a unique ID number of the fish. Uh, we don't do this in every fish just because it's uh, relatively expensive, but uh, in new restoration efforts, uh, many of those fish are pit tagged. Now, once the fish reach that eight inch length, uh, we load the fish up on our trucks. So we have a truck with a tank and oxygen on here. And if we're making really long hauls, this one, for instance, is uh, to New York. Uh, where we're hauling 10,000 lake sturgeon at this time. So we have a trailer that we pull behind as well to fit uh, more fish into. And the trip out to New York is about 18 hours. So we're monitoring those fish as we're driving out there, uh, making sure they have plenty of oxygen and fresh flowing water until we get to our delivery site, which you can see on the far right here. Uh, basically transferring fish over to some of our uh, 
partners uh, for New York uh, DEC. And then those fish will be stocked into tributaries uh, in the St. Lawrence River in this case. Now, that's just a brief overview of our lake sturgeon program. Uh, I can take questions about that as we get to the end. Uh, I did want to mention, though, uh, our new uh, Great River Road Interpretive Center. Uh, really looking forward to anybody who's passing through on, along the Great River Road. You know, we're right along the Mississippi Flyway here. A lot of wildlife to see. And then you can come check out our visitor center. There's four, basically four main exhibit rooms that you can check out with fish and wildlife and battle of uh, bad X uh, local to the area here. So it's been a really great addition to the hatchery as a whole. We get a lot more visitors coming through the area. Some of the other programs other than fish, we have outdoor classrooms and we work with a lot of local schools and a lot of local school groups come to the hatchery and they visit and we take them out on some of our, we have a nature trail, a wetland walk, uh, a bird observation area. There's a, there's a school group from Southern Bluffs, which is just on the south side of La Crosse. And then there's one on French Island, uh, north side of La Crosse. Uh, they actually come out with their manuals and listen for bird noises and identify birds and have journal for birds. It's a really great experience. On the far right here, we actually, we go to many classrooms as well. So we're teaching students about fish and mussels in the classroom. And we have uh, some prairie restoration work that we're trying to uh, really establish here. And we're trying to, I'd like to get some of your guys' input on that. You might uh, be more familiar than, than I am on the subject, but we have uh, school groups come out, uh, pollinator gardens, prairie grasses. We have ice fishing days. Top left here, you can see there's about 350 kids at this event. Uh, they, we have two fishing events uh, annually uh, and they fish for rainbow trout. So the kids get to come out, uh, they catch their fish, uh, generally in the spring, we'll clean the fish for them. And then we provide lunch and meals and prizes. And that's one of, one of the favorite things I get to do with my job, uh, besides going out and collecting walleyes and lake sturgeon, uh, interacting with the public is just uh, a great addition to all of our programs. And Dairyland, just uh, up the road from us, actually donated a handicap accessible dock so we have nursing homes that come out for sanctioned fishing events as well. And you can see that on the bottom right picture. And we're not just about fish. Um, another local teacher of ours comes out. She actually had, we have a couple of beehives in our, in the background here is actually the prairie that we're trying to restore. Uh, it gets a, a lot of reed canary grass. So we're working on uh, possibly some prescribed burns and uh, tilling and things like that to uh, get that established again, uh, just to support basically our monarchs and our butterflies and uh, any of the birds that would come along and prey on those food items as well. Uh, there's a big push in the Fish and Wildlife Service in the last five years too to conserve monarchs. So we've been picking milkweed uh, along our ponds. Uh, milkweed grows really well along uh, road banks and basically pond dikes. And we collect milkweed seeds and, uh, from the pods and we've been trying to plant those throughout the hatchery as well. And you see, yeah, right here, this on the left here is, it's probably about a seven acre, six acre parcel that we're trying to reestablish into a, a prairie. And we do have a lot of volunteer opportunities. On the bottom left here, like I said, those lake sturgeon we primarily rely on volunteers, volunteer students and staff to tag those fish. Uh, so you can see on the bottom left, a couple of our volunteers and another staff member tagging Lake Sturgeon. And our other really big program is our freshwater mussel program. So we do raise some mussels in cages out in the river and in our ponds. And as you can expect in the river, sitting in the river for almost a year, they can get pretty, uh, pretty dirty and they tend to fall apart. So every year we have basically a cage repair day where we have volunteers come down and help us uh, fix those cages. And we're home to a lot of different birds. So I thought I'd split this up a little bit here and show you a few of the pictures that uh, 
we have an outreach coordinator position that's vacant right now, but our outreach uh, coordinator took a lot of these pictures. Um, some of the red winged blackbird birds uh, in the summer, we can really hear those chirping around here. Uh, home to yellow rumped warbler, some dark eyed juncos, house finches, hairy woodpecker. Uh, Northern Cardinal. And that's just a few, a few of the species. And I, I can tell spring's on its way because in the last week we've had basically, there's been four, four uh, Canadian geese that have been hanging around. And in the last week, they've kind of went from four to eight to 16. So a good sign that spring's on its way. Now I'm gonna give a brief overview of our freshwater mussel program. And like I said, I'll take, I'll take all the questions at the end, and I have more pictures that I can show you guys and discuss. But we do have a building that's basically de designated to muscle restoration. And we kind of joke around here, we call it the Clam Palace. Um, just when the hatchery was built, uh, we had a volunteer basically make this sign for us, and it's kind of stuck with the hatchery ever since. Now, why should we care about freshwater mussels? If you're looking at... Uh, a list of imperiled species. You can see fish here, about 38% imperiled, uh, but freshwater mussels as a whole are around 70% imperiled. Hence the reason we are uh, propagating those at the fish hatchery here. Uh, some of the reasons for that decline, um, prehistoric and historic exploitation of mussels, as you can see here on the picture, dam impoundments, a lot of siltation and sedimentation in the river, water pollution, and of course, non-native species. And the primary non-native would be the zebra mussel. So we're seeing a lot of zebra mussels uh, on adult mussels in the river, basically colonizing the mussel. And they're, they're overlapping the area where that mussel uh, intakes water. So they can no longer basically breathe. They basically suffocate the mussel. So why should you care about mussels? Uh, what services do they provide? Uh, we, we go to a lot of outreach events and we like to bring an aquarium set up with us. So basically at the start of the day, you have two aquariums that are similar in siltation here and, and sediment. Uh, throughout the course of the day, one tank has mussels, one tank does not. So by the end of the day, these mussels are filtering water. So they're filtering out particles, algae, bacteria. And by the end of the day, you can see on the far right here, how clear the water is. And to give you an idea on how much they can filter, a thousand freshwater mussels filter approximately 400 to a thousand gallons in an hour. So 9,600 to 24,000 gallons per day, uh, per thousand mussels. Also, their shells provide homes for animals and plants, and they do serve as a wild food source for other uh, predatory species. Some of the species that we propagate here that are federally endangered, uh, when the program first started at the hatchery, we we're, were working on a uh, Hagen's eye pearly mussel, a uh, wing maple leaf, sheep nose, snuff box, and spectacle case. Now, mussels are unique that they require a special species as a host. Uh, some do have more than one species. So for instance, the Hagen's eye pearly mussel uses a largemouth bass as a host. The black sand shell mussel uses a walleye as a host. So these mussels are very species specific. And I'll, I'm gonna get into the life cycle to give you guys a better idea for anybody that doesn't know about the life cycle of freshwater mussels. But the reason we have so many ponds and different species of fish over 15 species of fish, because we raise over 17 species of mussels, and each one of those mussels requires a different host uh, in their juvenile stages. So here's an overview of a mussel life cycle. On the bottom in the middle here, you have your adult mussel in the river, and that adult mussel, after being fertilized, has glochidia, basically baby mussels inside of its gills. 
Now they require a fish to make that transportation to the next life stage. So a fish, a mussel, most of them have a lure basically to attract a fish. When that fish comes up to that lure and they bite that lure, that triggers the muscle to release these baby glochidia or baby mussels into the fish's mouth. So as the, as the fish is respiring, those baby mussels are attaching to the gills of the fish. And they're actually parasitic at that point. They're living off the blood of that fish. And it all depends on the species of the mussel and the species of the fish as well, on how long they actually live on the gills of the fish. And it's pretty much, uh, in terms of when you think of a relationship, you know, they're not trying to get too many mussels onto the fish because if the fish dies, then their life cycle doesn't go on as well. So in warmer water, approximately two weeks, these baby glochidia mussels will actually drop off into the sediment. And here's just an illustration of what they would look like underneath a microscope. They're basically like the size of a grain of sand. They're really small. They're hard to see with the naked eye. And from there, they grow, they become subadults, back into adulthood, where the process begins all over again. So you can think of the fish in this case as basically like the, because mussels, they have a foot, they do move around, but they can't get around great, great distances. So the fish is basically like a, a school bus or a transportation vehicle for these mussels. Just to give you a little bit better idea here, these are some of the images that were taken underneath a microscope. Going back to the host fish with the glochidia, this top right picture is a zoomed in, Im zoomed in image of mussels on the gills of a largemouth bass. So you can see all these white specks underneath the microscope. These are all baby mussels. Once those mussels drop off, they're right here, you can see so this is their little foot. So you can tell that they're alive. They're just a bunch of little baby mussels. And this one is a little hard to see, but this is an adult mussel. And here's its lure. Uh, basically, you can see it like an eye spot. They're kind of mimicking a minnow in this case, trying to attract that fish species to bite that, to uh, transfer that glochidia to the gills of the fish. So here's... Uh, kind of a live shot in action of a muscle in a stream here. And I like to think of it like an act, attractive, active attraction. Uh, it kind of looks like what we would use for fishing, right? To catch, to catch a smallmouth bass or a largemouth bass or a walleye. So these muscles are mimicking the prey for the fish that they need to, uh, to survive. Now in the wild, uh, this is happening, but like I said, they're 70% imperiled. So that's where the role of the hatchery comes in. We have two mussel biologists on station, and they go out to uh, Miss the Mississippi River, the Chippewa River, some of the local rivers in the area, and they're actually diving for adult mussels. They're actually uh, brooding baby mussels in their, in their gills. Uh, just an image here of an adult mussel on the bottom of a stream bank. Now another one here uh, with its mantle out and its lure sticking out. So the hatchery goes out and collects broodstock of these species that we're raising. And we bring them back to the hatchery. And at that point, we actually artificially put the mussels onto the gills of the fish. Uh, and we've done this a long time where we, we know what our infestation rates are. So we only put so many mussels on the gills of a fish. And I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of that, but uh, basically we're taking, uh, say 15 to 20 walleyes, putting them into a, a large bucket, adding that glochidia that we extracted from that adult into the water. And as that fish respires, those glochidia get attached to their gills. Now, once they're attached to the gills, there's uh, many options for us. We can either drop them off at station. Uh, we can control the water temperatures that drop them off and rear them on station. We can release the fish as a stocking with mussels on their gears, gills. So basically, in a sense, increasing sport fish opportunity as well as uh, 
uh, introducing muscles to the system that we're restoring. And we also have uh, a real uh, major tool in our toolbox here is our mobile aquatic rearing system. This sits uh, just south of us on Blackhawk Park, uh, right along the Mississippi River. And these mussels are filter feeding the algae and bacteria. And what better source of water than straight from the Mississippi River? So we actually filter water through this, uh, through this mobile rearing unit. There's tanks inside of here. So here's the inside of this uh, mobile rearing unit. Each one of these tanks has different species of mussels. So af after we have dropped them off in our building, uh, we'll move those mussels into uh, tanks like this where river water flows through them. And basically they have all summer to grow. Uh, once the water temperatures start to cool down in October, uh, we either stock those or bring them back to the hatchery for the next season to grow them to a bigger size. So some of the benefits, uh, it mimics their natural environment that they'd be living in, contains a wide variety of food for them to eat. And we do have filters in this system too, so we can kind of get out some of the sediment, uh, flow through, laminar flow. And we also do hold some of our host fish. Our host fish would be the fish that we'd be putting mussels on the gills of in these uh, trailers as well. Another method is our mussel cage culture. Like I showed you a picture of our volunteers helping us uh, uh, rehab some of these cages. We'll actually in infest fish, put mussels on the gills of fish, put them into these cages in the river. Once the mussels naturally fall off into the bottom of uh, sediment, so we put sand in the bottom of these cages, uh, we can actually go back out in the fall of the year and collect the mussels that have grown all summer long. So on the far left here, uh, just uh, some pictures of mussels that we've collected from those cages. This is actually a picture in uh, Dubuque at uh, Ice Harbor at the museum. Another picture, uh, Ice Harbor Dubuque. So another system we have what we call subseas. So these are actually containers that have flow through water through them and aeration. And we put our juvenile mussels in there into the river to get them to grow to a bigger size. This image right here would be basically the inside of one of these buckets. So here's your mussels over the course of a growing season over the summer. Now, in addition to those methods, we do uh, culture them intensely too inside of our mussel building or what we call our clam building. We do introduce uh, algae, uh, bacteria uh, into these systems so we can feed those mussels because our water that comes through here is basically pond water, which originates as underground well water. So it doesn't have all those essential, essential food items in it that they would see in the river. So they don't tend to grow as fast on station as they would in these streamside rearing units that we have. Another method, basically just sediment tanks, uh, pans filled with water with aeration. We put these newly dropped off mussels into these pans and we feed them a couple times a week and we can collect and monitor them that way as well. Another one that I already mentioned was uh, free release. So you can see here's a picture, right, of a bucket with fish in it. We put extracted the glucidia from the mussels, put them into this bucket. They took on the mussels on their gills. And at that point, once their fish are infested, we can simply go and release them to the river and they will go off on their own and drop off. And the mussels that we have basically in-house intensively that we bring back to the station, we either coat them with a, a unique ID number, or if you look real closely on some of these, we put a little glue dot on those. And that's essentially a way of us telling that it was a hatchery reared mussel at one time. Just like we would for sturgeon with coated wire tags or pit tags, this is just another alternative for freshwater mussels since we couldn't insert a tag into them. Okay, so just a brief overview of lake sturgeon, freshwater mussels on station, and then 
Uh, the last one I want to talk about just briefly is the Heinz Emerald Dragonfly. Now, we're working with partners in South Dakota from uh, SDSU, and they're actually collecting eggs from the Heinz Emerald Dragonfly, and they send the eggs to us. Uh, we're one of their partners that has a substantial place here that we can actually raise these dragonflies. There's not many left in the wild, so it's a restoration program. Uh, you can see here, this is a picture of an adult Heinz Emerald Dragonfly. When we receive the eggs from South Dakota, this is what they look like. So this is uh, under a microscope. They're really tiny, just like little black dots. Now, we actually have some on station. Uh, we have them in a refrigeration unit, basically just a, a little chiller system. And they'll be hatching. Uh, some of them start at the hatch, but most of them will hatch in the next month or two. From there, they'll go into uh, one of our ponds and they'll be in individual cages. So this is your uh, nymph, basically, or your larvae stage of the dragonfly. And we've been seeing within one to two years, they'll, uh, they're big enough to emerge uh, before we would release those. Each individual dragonfly gets its own little cage compartment. So if you look inside this cage right here, here's your dragonfly. And we're monitoring those basically weekly, checking all of them, making sure survival is good, oxygen is good in our ponds. They have plenty of food to eat. And one last endeavor that we've uh, kind of come across, these uh, dragonflies, they actually, as, uh, as larvae, they burrow into crayfish burrows. And it's a specific crayfish that they, burrow into. So we've actually, from South Dakota, we've actually got some crayfish on station too. And we're, we're trying to see if we can uh, raise a fair number of those to be stocked to pr provide more habitat for these, uh, these larvae Heinz Emerald dragonflies. So that's just a brief overview. And I think uh, I'll open it up to questions if anybody has any, and we can look at more pictures and I can talk a little bit more. Well, thank you guys for listening. Thanks, Ori. There are some questions in the chat. If you wanted to open that up now, I'll go through those questions first, then maybe Gary, uh, after that, we can open or unmute people. All right, I'll scroll back up to the chat here. Gary says, type your question here. Steve, was anyone from Genoa involved in the recent, recent caviar scandal? So I'm going to be very political on this. Uh, we were advised not to talk about anything going on with the caviar scandal. I do know personally a lot of those guys because uh, that system that I was talking to you guys about on the Wolf River, we actually work with those guys to collect eggs. But we basically were there one day. And this whole caviar scandal, I think a lot of it happened uh, during the lake spearing season. And uh, we're not really supposed to comment about it. But nobody at Genoa was involved in that process. So Gary says, how do you keep predators, i.e. fish eating birds and mammals, from feasting on your ponds? That's a great question. Uh, so throughout the migration season, we have uh, many blue herons. We have eagles all winter long. Um, some kingfishers, I'm just thinking of predatory fish birds, uh, kingfishers. Um, what else? Oh, mergansers that come through and uh, also cormorants. So. Uh, to answer your question directly, we do have a depredation permit uh, to uh, dispatch nuisance species if they become a nuisance. And we tend not to do that. What we, what we do have is basically, it looks like a flare gun. It's called, called a bird banger. Uh, you put a flare in it, and if a bird becomes a problem, we kind of aim it overhead. And that tends to just spook the birds enough to go back onto the river because as you guys know, we're located right along the Mississippi River, right along the flyway. So it's nothing for uh, birds to think that 
this is their natural, some of their natural habitats. So we do see a lot of birds coming in. James Richards, we raise walleye and know we have two to two and a half minutes to fertilize the eggs. Is it the same for sturgeon? Yeah, very good question. So when we're uh, fertilizing walleyes, you know, the, once the milt is activated with water, yeah, 30 seconds to two minutes, uh, we're lucky. I have tested that on some sturgeon where we activate the milt with, with water and it's about the same. You got about a minute, a minute to two minutes of activity. So we take special care in not getting any water into our uh, milt samples. Yeah, it's a very good, very good question. And for sturgeon, you can actually, uh, if you fertilize too long, uh, you can actually, what we call polyspermy, multiple sperm can enter and it would cause the egg to be uh, not viable in, in most cases. So we actually rinse that milt off uh, within uh, two minutes of fertilization. Don says, do you tag any of the released muscles in some way to find later? So in terms of the muscle program, yes, we're putting glue dots on those, uh, like I said, and the adult muscles, we do give like, it's a sticker with a unique ID number uh, based on the species. So we do uh, track them that way as well. I know there's been like uh, pit tags and acoustic arrays set up where you can kind of track their movements where you, ins where you glue that pit tag or transponder onto the muscle, basically seeing how much they move and then uh, giving that muscle a unique ID number. So that does happen too. But the volume of muscles that we raise uh, in terms of cost, glue dotting those muscles is, seems to be the most cost effective and the most reliable to tell if it's a, ha it's a hatchery raised muscle. James Richards, uh, how do you control zebra mussels? So we work with a lab, uh, USGS on French Island. And, you know, zebra mussels, they tend to fluctuate uh, year after year. You know, there's years that they're way worse than others. But the lab up on French Island is actually looking into uh, what they're calling a pseudomonas, basically a bacteria that could potentially would potentially kill zebra mussels and not affect our native mussels. And, and it's been kind of an ongoing process and it's, you know, it's, it's really hard to say how that's gonna all come out by biocontrol basically. Charles. There are Heinz emeralds in Winnebago County at Lost Flora Fen. Yeah, so Northern Wisconsin, yep. So some of those uh, ones that we're raising, that program just started about three years ago. So yeah, some of them are going up to, uh, I wanna say Door County area. Uh, James says, when do you treat the sturgeon eggs with iodine and at what concentrations? So after the eggs are fertilized, uh, they're treated with iodine or iodine for, for about 10 to 15 minutes and at a rate of 100 part per million uh, iodine. And that is the same thing we would do with our walleye eggs. And then uh, our trout eggs we receive, so like rainbow trout eggs we receive from Ennis National Fish Hatchery, which is in Montana. Uh, any eggs that come to us, we'll disinfect those as well, uh, even if they're at the eyed stage. We'll disinfect them before they come on station. And in our buildings we have, we hold like, three to four, depending on the year, uh, wild species of fish that came in as eggs. So all of our water is basically treated with UV sanitation before it flows back out. What HED population is the source of the eggs? So these came from, there's two populations. Um, one is TPW, and that's a top point wild and the other one is escaping me right now but they're collected basically in uh, Illinois and I can get back to you on that I, I just have to look up and see what the other one is do you have any data on how successful the muscle stocking is and what is your 
best success story. Ooh, I'd like to defer that one to our, my muscle colleagues, but you know, it's really species dependent. There's, there's some species that are a lot easier to raise in captivity than others. And likewise goes with the fish. Some of the fish that the muscles require are a lot harder to keep alive. Uh, to give you an example, uh, channel catfish uh, use the uh, wing maple leaf mussel uses channel catfish. Well, unlike some of your other species that only live on the gills for about possibly two to three weeks, channel catfish, the wing maple leaf mussels live on the gills of channel catfish all winter long. So trying to keep those alive in captivity for over the winter before they produce is one of our greatest struggles. And what is your best success story? So the hatchery is one of the primary uh, original zones of muscle propagation, uh, that including the Missouri State as well. But uh, yeah, a lot of our natural resource damage assessments uh, come through with uh, funding to support our programs. Um, I don't know, the, the program itself is growing immensely over the years. And uh, the need is large and we're continually getting a lot of support for the program. Gary said, is there any way to build the water steps to allow the fish to get beyond the dams like we see out west with salmon? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, I take it we're referring to lake sturgeon in this scenario and they're, they're such a big fish. And one of the alternatives to a ladder is, uh, sorry, as, as like a stair step ladder, an alternative to a stair step ladder, they're uh, basically like an elevator system. So those fish will come upstream. Uh, they have one in Green Bay, Wisconsin. On the, I believe it's on the Fox River. And the fish will swim up into that basically the elevator system where they'll lift them up above the dam and release them above. So they'll, they'll be lifted from below and released above. And some of our other stocking or restoration efforts, the DNR has actually collected adults from below dams and transported them upstream. Uh, they tend to come back downstream though, uh, for the most part. Do hatchery release sturgeon still migrate? That is like the golden question. And like our uh, streamside rearing unit for clams or mussels, we have streamside rearing units set up uh, throughout Wisconsin and Michigan that do the same exact thing. So we're raising fish lake sturgeon on natal water where they originated. And we were three years into a study right now with uh, the Michigan DNR where we're raising about 4,000 lake sturgeon from uh, portions of the Maumee River. And then in Toledo uh, where the zoo is, they're raising them on the original water source. And we're pit tagging all those fish. And we're trying to track what the survival is gonna be and what the recruitment rate is gonna be in the future. So that's, yeah, a million dollar question. And we, we're looking forward to finding that out. But I can tell you, uh, sturgeon raised at the hatchery, released at eight inches are surviving at about a rate of 60%, which is unreal compared to most other species of fish that are stocked. Chris says, Mink River Estuary is one of four preserves owned and managed by TNC in Door County that is home to the rare Heinz Emerald Dragonfly. Yep, yep. What's the greatest abundance of this federally endangered dragonfly in the world? Yeah, great, yep. Cool, does anybody else have any more questions they wanna to add to the chat or, or ask through, uh, through video? Gary, do you want to unmute people? Just see if there's a couple more questions. Uh, we'll honor everybody's time and Anori's time as well. I think everybody has the ability to unmute and uh, video themselves or release their video so we can see you again. Uh, you should have that ability. Um, Th thank you, Ori. Great presentation. No
a lot of great information and awesome work that's being done for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me. And uh, you know, these zoom meetings are great. You guys get to learn a lot of stuff, but it, it's not like the real deal. So when, when things open back up, I encourage anybody that wants a personal tour of the hatchery, contact me, send me an email. We'll get you guys set up and right. let you know what's going on. I'd love to share it in person with you. Any last questions? People are unmuting themselves, so oh, here, here. Keep them yeah. People are starting to appear. It's good to see everybody again instead of just your names. So you can show up yeah. too if you want to. Yeah. Anybody yeah. have any further questions? Can speak. <laughs> Very informative. Thank you. Thank you for all your information. Yeah, thank you for listening. It was great, except for the uh, picture of Lambo Field, but that's all I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yep. Go Packers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we see